The goals of treatment and prevention are, if you look at this, Alzheimer's disease is fundamentally an insufficiency in a neuroplasticity network. So you have a network in your brain, you have this beautiful synaptic dance that is deciding, are you making synaptoblastic? Are you making and keeping synapses or are you downsizing? Very much analogous to what happened to our country during the pandemic. When it first came out, we had an insult, SARS-CoV-2. And so we were all told shelter in place, social distancing, don't go to work, downsize, et cetera. We went into a protective downsizing mode and we ended up in a recession. That's exactly what your brain is doing when it sees these various insults. And it can be from P. gingivalis from your mouth. It can be from leaky gut. It can be from insulin resistance, all these sorts of things. And so we have to identify what is putting your brain into a protective downsizing mode. And by the way, the amyloid that we associate with Alzheimer's disease is an antimicrobial that is part of your innate immune system. So it is part of the inflammatory response. As long as you've got the ongoing insults, you're gonna to continue to make the amyloid, you're gonna to continue to downsize. So what we wanna do is identify what's causing that and then address those things and then rebuild. So the beginning is we want to get people with optimal energetics. One of the most common contributors is poor support from the brain. And that can be because of poor blood flow, poor oxygenation, poor mitochondrial function, or poor substrates, ketones and glucose. For most of us, we are able to go back and forth and burn ketones or burn glucose. And we're doing that as a part of being metabolically flexible. And unfortunately, when we start developing cognitive decline, what happens is we're losing both of those. We typically have the insulin resistance from years of processed food and years of, of high, high glycemic index foods and things like that, but we're also not keto adapted. And of course, as long as your insulin remains high, you're not able to generate endogenous ketones. So in fact, it's helpful to get people into ketosis. And we recommend at the beginning, just start with exogenous ketones, at least get them that energy. These brains are starving when they come to us to, because of cognitive decline. So we'd like to get people into ketosis, typically 1.0 to 4.0 millimolar beta hydroxybutyrate, or if you measure it with a breathalyzer, over seven ACEs, preferably over 10. We'd like to make sure they have optimal blood flow. So there's as where things like uh, exercise and uh, katsu bands and EWOT and things can be very helpful. Some people do use uh, uh, HBOT, uh, which is another way to go. Um, that doesn't give you the exercise part, obviously, but it can be, especially for people who have a vascular component or a traumatic component, it can be quite helpful for these people. Secondly, we want to make them insulin sensitive and metabolically flexible. And of course, we can do that with the help of diet, exercise, sleep, stress reduction, all these sorts of things. And then at times, we'll want to use specific, uh, specific supplements. Berberine can be helpful. Uh, chromium can be helpful, making sure people have an optimal zinc. Zinc is critical for making um, and secreting insulin, as you know. So there are, again, numerous things you can do to get people to be insulin sensitive and ultimately metabolically flexible so that they can go back and forth. Many people will present and their HOMA IRs will be one, one and a half, two, three. I mean, they clearly have insulin resistance. So that's part of getting best outcomes. And then trophic support. And that's three different things. Growth factors, nerve growth factor, uh, and BDNF and things like that. And again, there are things you can do. You can increase BDNF with exercise. You can increase BDNF with whole coffee fruit extract. You can increase nerve growth factor with Alcar as an example. Also with Hericium arenaceus, the, the lion's mane also increases NGF. So again, the armamentarium, which we've been told over the years um, is zero, that there's nothing you can do for people with cognitive decline. Nothing could be further for the truth. There's a tremendous amount you can do. And understanding for each person what's actually causing their decline, you can then use your armamentarium appropriately to address those things. And then hormones. Many people will be low on thyroid, low on estradiol, low on testosterone, low on vitamin D, things like that. You can address all of these things again. 
And then, of course, uh, bioidentical hormone replacement has been very helpful in cognitive decline as part of an overall program. Years ago, it was tried as a monotherapy. Um, it didn't help very much. But again, this is part of an overall protocol. You are changing network function within the brain. So you have to identify and address the different pieces of the network function. This old fashioned idea of, we're just gonna give you one drug and it's gonna do everything is a kind of ridiculously naive view. And of course, I think you know, functional medicine has addressed that point for years. And then of course, nutrients that I mentioned, vitamin D, vitamin B12 was mentioned earlier. Uh, all of these things are critical again for trophic support. And then of course, resolution of inflammation. The amyloid itself is part of the innate immune system. As long as you've got P. gingivalis or you've got Borrelia or you've got Babesia or you've got things like this entering your brain, you can, you're going to be making the amyloid to kill those. So we wanna resolve it and often using SPMs to help with the resolution, very good, but you want to remove the source. It's critical. If this is because of a leaky gut, then removing that source is going to be critical for getting best outcomes. And then of course, treatment of pathogens. And some people will end up having Borrelia, other tick-borne illnesses. Some people will have herpes simplex. That's been associated with cognitive decline. And in fact, the treatment of herpes simplex outbreaks from a Taiwanese study was shown to reduce the likelihood of developing Alzheimer's by about 60%. So it's a pretty striking effect for people who are having outbreaks. Um, other herpes viruses have also been associated with Alzheimer's disease. So this is critical. And then optimization of both gut microbiome and oral and sinus microbiome. And things like dental sidin can be very helpful. So you can check, for example, with uh, with oral uh, DNA or myperiopath, you can check to see whether there are pathogens because this is another association with the uh, you know with with uh, cognitive decline, and then detoxification from inorganics, organics, and biotoxins, as I mentioned earlier, and you know standard sorts of detoxification. We'll get to that in just a second here, and then stimulation. People tend to do best with some form of stimulation, whether it's brain training, whether it's light or magnetic stimulation. And again, you wanna be doing this on the backbone of supporting the brain. Just like you don't wanna tell someone to lift weights when they have malnutrition, once you get them doing the right things, then you wanna have some form of stimulation to get best outcomes. And then we want to improve the uh, adaptive immune system and reduce the innate. Because what happens in both COVID-19 and in Alzheimer's disease, you have the innate system outstripping the adaptive system. And of course, this is why if COVID-19, people die from cytokine storm. In Alzheimer's disease, they're dying from cytokine drizzle. So you've got a mild increase in this innate system and the adaptive system has not been able to clear whatever it is that is the insult. And then we want to reduce the amyloid. And there are things, in fact, curcumin is one of the things that actually binds quite tightly to amyloid and it can help remove the amyloid. But you can see that you don't want to remove the amyloid and do nothing else. The amyloid is there protecting you. So you want to do the other things and then remove the amyloid. And I think in the long run, this is where the drugs that remove amyloid are actually going to be useful. I trying to just remove it and remove the amyloid without recognizing it, why it's there really makes no sense. And then finally, regeneration, synaptogenesis, these things are all very, very helpful. Mm -hmm.